Good Wednesday evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sports Medicine Forum here at Total Turf Experience in Pittman, New Jersey. I'm again with my partner in crime, Flyers head trainer Jim McCrossin. And Jim, we got a couple guests this week as we will be discussing shoulder injuries. Yes, we do. Uh, we have Dr. Stephen Fry from Reconstructive Orthopedics. Um, Dr. Fry is a fellowship trained in sports medicine and the Board of Orthopedic Surgeries, who specializes in surgical and non-surgical treatments of the hip, knee, and shoulder. And surprise, surprise, that's going to be our topic tonight. And to the left of me, we have Dan Goring. And Dan's a physical therapist here at Reconstructive Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. And Dan, I'm certain that you've treated quite a few shoulders in your day. So, yeah, so we have a really decent board, right, from doctors to therapists to uh, Chris and I, and Chris will be talking about some of his injuries that he sustained yeah. while playing for the Flyers. Yeah, I had uh, probably some of my most memorable, memorable injuries over the years were indeed uh, shoulder injuries, and specifically my left shoulder. I said in a tease last week, I have two shoulders. One of them works, the other one's very, very limited. And, and that really happened when I was 18, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And, and what I did uh, in playoff series back 20 years ago, when Jimmy was still uh, running our, our, the gauntlet through our uh, generation of players and stuff like that. But, Doc, we talk about it now. And, and, I mean, the shoulder injury, you can look at any single sport, football, hockey, basketball, golf, uh, just about anything. They're a pretty prevalent injury, aren't they? And how, how much do, they, do you see the shoulder making up for more of the injuries you see in sports, especially in fall sports right now? It's a very common injury. Uh, I think we see shoulder injuries uh, probably as much or maybe more than really uh, any other uh, body part. Shoulders and knees are probably the, the, the two most. Um, in that, I would say that um, at this point, uh, with the, the sports we have going right now, you have a lot of contact injuries. Um, one of the big injuries we'll see is shoulder, dislocati uh, shoulder dislocation, so shoulder instability. Uh, another very common injury that we would see is actually uh, a shoulder separation, which is very different than a shoulder dislocation. Um, and we can get into a little bit of the differences in just a few minutes. Uh, lastly, I think uh, uh, similarly, um, and we'll probably see this a little more in the spring as baseball starts ramping back up and you start getting more into kind of your slap tears and slap injuries. Pretty interesting stuff. And I know the other stuff, you talk about shoulder separations, which are probably more prevalent with Jimmy and you guys. Uh, when you talk about shoulder injuries, how, what are the difference between an actual shoulder separation or an AC sprain or an AC separation as you hear that? Dan, take that. Thanks, absolutely. Yeah, so when you're talking about a shoulder separation or a separated shoulder, it's usually a, an injury most commonly I think of either a hockey player getting checked into the boards, falling on their shoulder, or a quarterback as they're getting tackled and landing on their shoulder. And then we're talking about the acromioclavicular joint, right, where the clavicle, um, your collarbone meets the scapula. Totally different injury than a shoulder dislocation where you have the glenohumeral joint, kind of your ball socket joint, comes out, right? So that requires a whole different um, course of action after the injury then does the AC joint separation. And then also with those AC separations, you could be dealing with a collarbone fracture or any number of, of other conditions there too. So it's a real complicated joint. It's a joint that can experience a myriad of injuries and um, something you really gotta be cognizant of as you're treating and, and going through um, you know, the season. Look at the story time. <laughs> two years ago, um, two years ago we had a player and it was right before we were going to leave on our road trip to out west and the player got hit, and we're not talking about an AC separation, now we're talking about a sternoclavicular separation, but this time it didn't, go, it didn't come out, it went in, and was actually pressing up against his artery. And then it becomes a medical emergency. So if your son or daughter says they got pain and you're palpating and they're pointing here, that's a, to me, that's even more painful than an AC separation because that takes a, a long time to go. But you really should, if, if they're pointing to this area, if they're pointing to this area, make sure you see a doctor, right? Get it evaluated quick to make sure it wasn't like uh, what happened to us, that we, we, we took him right to the hospital and he had to have surgery and everything worked out well. He came back to play, and, but I had to tell that story. Yeah, I had, I've had sternoclavicular problems as well on my right side, not the other one. It actually popped out and comes out like at the top, and it still sticks out after all these years, but that, that's very much part of it. Can there be a misinterpretation, Doc, between uh, a shoulder separation and, say, a collarbone or, or sternoclavicular injury, or are you pretty sure one is the other when it happens? So, so you can certainly have um, a little confusion or overlap between a clavicle injury and an AC joint injury. 
especially if the clavicle injury, sorry, thank you, especially if the clavicle fracture is, is down close to the AC joint, uh, down close to the end of the collarbone. Um, so, so it can be very difficult to tell without, without the benefit of an x-ray between those two. Um, over on the other side, closer to your chest, the sternoclavicular side, um, typically you're not going to confuse that with an AC joint injury. There's just enough distance between the two that it's pretty easy to distinguish between one and the other. Um, you can have a pretty rare fracture of your collarbone, of your clavicle, close to your um, SC joint. And again, that could be confused with an SC joint dislocation. But, but you're not going to confuse AC joint way out here with SC joint way in here. Very interesting. And I guess we'll, we'll move on to the next part of it, too. Um, both of you guys could tell us a little bit about SLAP. And that is also known as the... <sighs> Jimmy, well, I can't read your writings. That's the superior, superior labral tear anterior posterior. Just pretty easy medical terms that we're just familiarizing ourselves with. Tell us a little bit about that, guys, and, and what that means. Yeah, so slap tear is just re referring to a part of your shoulder, which is the labrum. So like we talk about that ball and socket joint articulation, within that socket we have a labrum, which helps deepen the articulation and make things a little bit more stable. So with a, a labral tear, if you, you know, have a tear in that superior labrum, that tear can cause some instability and a whole host of other issues, a lot of times pain deep in the shoulder joint and can really cause, cause some problems. And sometimes this could be a traumatic injury. You see this a lot with outfielders and you know, diving and different things like that. So um, something you always want to be cognizant of as a parent, especially if there's a trauma and especially if it involves a trauma with an outstretched arm or with an arm that's in a bent uh, position, even backwards or, or something like that. And of course, hockey, you guys are the experts of hockey and how that, you know, that can happen in that sport. But, you know, definitely if you're having any sort of trauma in the shoulder, you know, get evaluated by someone like Dr. Frey and, and, and reconstructive um, orthopedics. And, and, and Doc, in your mind with slap tears, right, um, I've always gone on the impression that there are certain type of slap tears you don't have to worry about, right? And uh, I always tell our guys to take a look at the, well, now they're digital clocks, but if you look at a clock, and if you know, you're seeing anything that goes from 11 o'clock to nine o'clock, that posterior aspect of it. For hockey, we really don't have to rush out and get those repaired. And many, many of our guys have those. And um, uh, even, even with a slap that maybe goes from one o'clock to two o'clock in the clock candle, uh, is, is that something to be concerned about? But I guess my question to you is, when, did, when does it become a concern? When do you say, hey, this is, this is not good and we're going to have to do something about it? So it's a pretty complicated uh, question to answer in a, in a short period of time because there's a lot of overlap and there are a lot of factors that are considered. Uh, age of the athlete, um, um, uh, uh, timing of the season, and whatnot. In general, there is a normal anatomic variant that could be uh, that in that kind of one to two o'clock position, which uh, can look like a slap, but it's actually not a slap, and that, that's not something you want to operate or fix from a surgical standpoint. That's just called subralabral foramen, and it's standard and it's normal. Um, once you go a little further back in the shoulder, um, typically, yeah, you can, uh, uh, if it's not overly symptomatic and the person can play through it, then frequently you can play through it and fix it at a time when it's a little more convenient, <coughs> say, at the end of a season. Um, as a, someone's getting a little bit older, um, and, and, and you know that, that term is variable. As I get older, uh, that, that number seems to go up in my mind. But um, uh, someone starts reaching their 40s and whatnot, it becomes less uh, important to, to actually fix that. And at some point, it's actually a sort of a compensatory thing where if you start getting concerned with fixing it, um, you may actually um, tighten that person's shoulder up and, and create some other issues. So you have to be very judicious about uh, the way that you approach it. Typically, you really want to give it a uh, good try phys with physical therapy and try to get, get it mostly asymptomatic um, without going down a surgical road. Um, sometimes it's quite simply avoid one or two aggravating positions, and if you avoid those particular positions and if your sport doesn't require you to do that, so let's say let's say you can't do push-ups and you just have a hard time with reaching way overhead, but as a hockey player, you don't necessarily need to particularly do that. Sometimes you can avoid going down that road. Um, um, sometimes you can't get rid of those symptoms. Sometimes it's always a factor. It's, it's always causing pain, and it uh, really affects everything that you're trying to do, in which case, in that scenario, you wind up going down the road of surgery. And uh, there's a couple different ways to fix it, and you just go with the age-appropriate style. 
Yeah, really interesting. I have a couple of questions too. I'll ask you about my own uh, experiences that I went through, like I said, about 20 years ago. Uh, another thing we talked about the slap, uh, the slap injuries, uh, the tears. How are these tears diagnosed? Yeah, so there's a couple of different reasons. I think that uh, Dr. Frey could speak more to the medical imaging. I think that you're going to be looking for an MRI is, you know, the best determinant of the soft tissue. But a lot of times, too, the MRIs can show things that might not be, pre you know, relevant or, or um, really causing the patient, patient's issues. So I think, first of all, a good physical exam from a physician or a physical therapist to determine is there any signs or symptoms of the slap tear. And the things I'm looking for, one of the most common complaints is a pain that's very, very deep within the shoulder joint, something that they can't touch, something they feel is very, very deep inside. Also, sometimes you'll get clunking. Um, as they move through certain ranges of motions, they'll experience a clunk or kind of a, a grinding type feeling, but mostly they'll describe it as a clunk. And then um, sometimes, you know, with that slap tear too, as we're talking about the origin of the biceps muscle, Biceps irritation can, can follow hand in hand with the slap tear. So those are three things that I'd be looking for in the physical exam. And then I'll go to somebody like Dr. Frey and, you know, see what we could look at on imaging. And then, you know, it will be his expertise to put that physical exam together with the imaging and see if, you know, we could really determine if that's the primary origin or the source of it. Now, many of the time that uh, when our athletes come up to us and um, they may not say anything, may, may happen that game. and. Uh, you know, they decide, okay, we're going to ice my shoulder down. They just said my, you know, my shoulder got dinged, and the word dinged is not appropriate, but that's what they say a lot. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, um, they'll start to say my, my, my athletic performance, my performance is going down. And for us, it really depends if it's your top hand, your control hand, right. or your bottom hand. So bottom hand's going to take a lot more hits to it, and it's going to take a lot more pressure, especially for defensemen holding people up like this and you're holding up a guy that's 220 pounds, right, and with your one hand, and you come in after the game and it's pretty darn sore. So, you know, over the course of time, we try the rehab aspect of it, but at one point, it may affect their performance so much, it's time to, you know, again, to see the doc and make a decision, is now the time to do surgery. Yeah, and, and I guess, I'll, you know, where we're at, I'll, I'll go into a couple injuries. One of them that I saw Sunday, uh, that is something we see a lot of. Uh, Fletcher Cox came off the field. It was a terrible football game, and I'm not talking about that, but uh, he had clearly what everybody saw on TV. His shoulder was out, right? The announcer said it. You could see he was in duress. And then they, they did the little magic, pulled it, popped it back in. Everybody thought he might, that might be it for the year, but he's back out there a few minutes later. What exactly happens with that type of scenario, and why is that something that we see, something that's so prevalent among shoulder injuries, especially with athletes? So, so the shoulder, is a, it's a ball and socket joint. And unlike the hip, which is a much deeper ball and socket joint, um, where there's a lot of stability because of this deep bony articulation, the shoulder is a little more like a, like a golf ball sitting on a golf tee, granted on the side, but it's just much less stable. You're relying on the soft tissues for the stability. And um, what you have going around the, the golf tee, the socket of the, of the shoulder joint, which is called the glenoid, is uh, basically a rubber gasket. It's not really rubber, but it, awful, it looks an awful lot like rubber. And that rubber gasket basically suction cups onto the ball and adds a lot to the stability of the ball and socket joint. Now, it doesn't take too much energy to basically push that ball, uh, the golf ball, off the golf tee. And when it does, um, it can do something called tear, tear the labrum. Um, it can do additional damage in there but it really doesn't take a whole lot and there's a few positions that the arm can be in that really leave it um, vulnerable to those particular injuries um, typically you know in the short term the first thing you want to do is get it back in uh, once it's back in typically pain is dramatically improved and then from there the you know there's a number of factors that go into the decision making process um, if it's going to need surgery, if it's going to need surgery now, can have surgery later on. And again, a lot of those factors are severity of the injury, age of the person, time of the year, time of the season, um, uh, position. Um, you know, can, is it something that you can brace, or it's something, is it something where, you know, if you're a wide receiver, the brace doesn't typically work because you can't get your arms up to, to, to catch the ball. So a number of factors go into the, the decision-making process uh, to f if you need to fix, and if so, when you, when you should fix. Good stuff. Uh, a couple more here, guys. Uh, what is a shoulder dislocation, which is kind of what we're talking about, separation dislocation, and a shoulder sublux, uh, subluxation? Well, Dan, why don't you take subluxation? 
Yeah, so subluxation refers to, I, I like to think of those two terms, and they sometimes use synonymously, but I, I like to think of it as the subluxation is a less severe uh, version than a dislocation. Sometimes you'll have a patient who will quote unquote sublux, and then they can kind of move it back in on their own. Whereas if you have a dislocation, generally that's something that's going to need some assistance because we talk about the ball socket. That was a great analogy there. And then the ball coming completely off the socket would be a dislocation. A ball coming maybe partially off the socket would be a, a subluxation. So again, I think of those terms with the ball socket joint in terms of severity, right? You'd probably rather have a subluxation than a dislocation. Um, yeah. Dr. Pry, I just have a question um, because it gets brought up to me a lot. Parents will call me up. My son or daughter dislocated their shoulder. And um, do I get it? And it's not the first time, maybe it's the second time. At what point, and I know you kind of explained this, but at what point do you make a judgment call saying it's, it's time to get it fixed? Is that after they've gone through the, the bout of rehab, tried the harness, and I mean, we, it, literally we had a player that tried to jump up with the harness on and it went right inferior. So instead of going anterior, inferior, it went right through and it was time to get it fixed. But, uh, what do you see, in, mostly in your practice? So typically, first-time dislocator, um, traumatic dislocation. There's a, the two main categories that these fall into for shoulder dislocation. Ball actually coming at, off, rolling off the socket entirely. One is a traumatic dislocator, so during an injury. In other words, more of a multidirectional instability where someone's just sort of ligament loose and very, very uh, lax, and they can actually dislocate fairly low energy. Um, those ones you tend to do therapy, therapy, therapy a little more and then going down a surgical road. For your traumatic dislocator, the shoulder was fine, they took a hit, the shoulder popped out. Um, first time dislocator, frequently we won't fix that, we won't do a surgery, you get it back in, do some physical therapy, give it time to scar down and heal down. Sadly, unfortunately, there's a pretty high rate of re-dislocation. Once it's dislocated once, it'll probably dislocate again. So if there's a bad injury, the labrum is torn and it's displaced or it's displaced in the wrong place and they're very likely to dislocate again or they continue to be symptomatic or the shoulder doesn't tighten up the therapy, we'll go right into a surgery. Um, we'll fix it at that point. If, um, if they do real well with non-operative management, we do the physical therapy, the, it looks okay on MRI, there isn't a labral tear. Lots of times you don't fix that right away. You can try to get through a season, if sometimes you can brace them. Um, sometimes, don't ever have another problem with that shoulder again. It's a little less frequent, a little less common, but sometimes that's how it plays out. So, so you kind of wait and see. And if there's that second dislocation, then you kind of presume it's probably just going to keep happening. And at that point, you go down the road and start to fix. So I'll just say really quick before we get to the next question for you guys. I had hurt my shoulder as a high school senior. I was 18 years old. I slid into the boards. And my shoulder from that point on was never really the same again. I always got it good to a point where it was comfortable but I'm still not able to even move my shoulder back where my other one goes back freely. Um, I'm just going back again to a couple playoff series with Jimmy and other trainers that helped me. I would literally go right before warm-up and I would wait for the shot every game. I was like a dog waiting for a bowl of food. And that I knew would get me through the game that night. So which, which is what I'm talking about is, it you know, gave me the, the relief. I think it was a Toradol, I believe I was taking, or uh, yeah, uh, Toradol I believe was what, what I was taking. And that's what was pretty common then, you know, make sure you just get Figure out a way to play, because if you weren't, you're letting your teammates down, and that's what the old adage was. So when I say that, and I did have finally had a scope, I believe, either that summer or the next, my shoulder's a lot better now, because I'm obviously not using it as much. I still have limited movement, but when you talk about that, uh, for treatments for, for people, I had one when I was younger, is that common, guys, when you go through that, that that injury will continue to happen through life, and it seems to happen even more so when you play professional sports or uh, as you got older? Um, what are we doing now for shoulder instability or yeah. dislocations? The good, the good thing is that they're rare uh, in our sport, which is good because, uh, as you know, uh, the physicality of our sport has diminished. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it, you're not seeing, good or bad, you know, but you're not seeing them as like we used to. Yeah. And um, though we still, have, we still have them, so it depends on the time of the season, and I, I, I don't like to say that, but as uh, Dr. Fry and Dan were saying, it, it really depends on the amount of instability that you have. 
you know, we have the luxury, we see our players seven days a week. We can add rehab into it. Uh, now we're using BFR with it. Um, you know, could you use PRP with it, Dr. Pry? I mean, yeah. with, a, with a small tear? Could, with, small tear. With a, They're both adjuncts to your rehab, and uh, because you're really throwing things at it to hopefully get you through the season, and if the instability is too bad and it's affecting your play, then it's time to back off and say, okay, you got to get it fixed. But otherwise, you're going to rehab it. And Danny, if you want to talk about a little bit about the rehab for a short. Yeah. So specific to something like instability, I think that. Um, I like Dr. Frey's analysis of the shoulder where you're relying on those soft tissue structures. You're relying on the rotator cuff to stabilize the shoulder, the pec, the lats, all the scap stabilizers and the rhomboids that kind of hold up that scapula, thoracic region, and in turn the shoulder. So what you're going to be doing in therapy is first we want to make sure the shoulder moves well. You don't want to overstretch it, but you want to make sure we have good mobility within the shoulder and then start to initiate some light strengthening around the shoulder and around the muscles um, surrounding the scapula, thoracic, that's your mid-back area trying to get those muscles nice and strong too. And if we can do that, then we can really improve the chances of, of that person having another dislocation, right? Because the, the, um, the ligaments after the dislocation aren't as strong. They go from strong to not as strong. It's, you're losing that passive stoppage. So when you lose a passive stoppage, you have to improve the dynamic stability, which in our world is muscles. We've got to get the muscles strong and, um, and keep, them, keep them that way as much as possible. I guess I do have a couple questions uh, outside of sports for shoulders. What are the most most common injuries that you'll see uh, just from a regular person on an everyday type of, of life walk, walk through life that maybe you won't see necessarily in, in college or pro sports or even sports in general? Um, so yeah, I, I think that soft tissue injuries are huge. Um, a lot of people come in with anterior shoulder pain. Um, a lot of times there's a biceps a process going on, a lot of biceps tendonitis, um, slight rotator cuff strains. There's people who, you know, come in the clinic and they just may have gone moving or lifted something heavy overhead and they can have a, a small strain of the rotator cuff. So I just look at those soft tissue structures around the shoulder, the pectoralis, the lats, um, the rotator cuff, and the biceps. It's just all those being um, kind of muscular injuries. Sometimes they go together. So I'd say just those general overuse type muscular injuries are the most common that I see. What about you, Dr. Frey? I think absolutely. It's, um, you see a lot of the overuse type injuries. I'd say in the People under the age of 30, I think that the most common injury would probably be, you know, AC joint separation, but that's a little bit of a category of its own. For the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, that would be your instability. And then as you're getting over the age of 30, I think you start heading more towards rotator cuff. And it's uh, rotator cuff, and that's a whole spectrum. It goes from, you know, inflammation, tendonitis, tendinosis, uh, partial thickness tear, full thickness tear, retracted tear, and so on down the line. So, so but I think that, um, Rotator cuff is probably what we see more than anything else. And there, there's a lot of overlap between some of these injuries. Um, your labrum uh, across the top, your slap tear goes directly into your labrum down across the front, which would be your instability or bank heart type tear. Um, once you get one of these tears, the ball starts to ride up a little bit relative to the socket. And when it does, what lives right above it is the, is the rotator cuff. So the ball will start banging into the rotator cuff and irritating the rotator cuff. And what's attached to your labrum uh, right there at the top is your biceps tendon, so you start getting irritation in the biceps tendon. So th there's a lot of overlap between them, but I would say most commonly under the age of 30, instability, uh, over the age of 30, rotator cuff. Jimmy, you got one more here before me. We have time for a question, but the last one here, sorry, I can't read your writing. Well, before I get started with that, just remember, all right, if you injure your shoulder, your son or daughter injures their, their shoulder, make sure you see somebody that's credible, all right? You know, that um, there's a lot of people out there that you know, will say, well, you know, it sounds like what I used to have and this is what I did. And the best way to treat something is knowing what you have. And that's going to see a doctor like Dr. Fry, physical therapist like Dan, and, you know, go to somebody credible and make sure you get the proper diagnosis. So you're not just beating around the bush and wasting three, four, five weeks doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, but my next question is, Dr. Pry, maybe you can answer this one, because you see it uh, more and more in people as, they, um, as they're doing 
over the head exercise and quite a bit of it, or is um, you're getting older, shoulder impingement. Um, what is shoulder impingement? So the, there's uh, multiple kinds of shoulder impingement, and we're kind of getting in the weeds with this. Uh, so the chromial impingement is a so coracoid impingement, is posterior impingement, but the one that we talk about the most is the most common by far is subacromial impingement. And, and that, that goes along the lines of what I was starting to say about um, different types of rotator cuff injuries. So, so where the rotator cuff is kind of at the top of the ball, of the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, as you bring your arm up, um, you can uh, sort of irritate or bang the, or squeeze the rotator cuff between the, 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 the ball and the undersurface of the tip of the shoulder, the acromion. And um, that can start leading to irritation and breakdown and inflammation of the, of the rotator cuff, which lies underneath. Um, and that can lead to a whole constellation of symptoms, frequently which can be corrected relatively easily as long as you don't let it go. Um, if you ignore it and just kind of keep doing the same thing, sometimes it can become more of a severe injury, turning, you know, what is an otherwise an, over, an overuse injury, an irritation into a partial tear, into a full thickness tear, and so on stuff at this point now guys we'll do as we do every week if anyone has any questions please come up and uh be happy to well we got enough specialists up here if they can't answer we're in a lot of trouble good to see it hey so dr fred this question's for you um what role does body posture have in reducing the chance of shoulder injuries that's a great question actually i think dan would do a fantastic job at answering this but i'll give you my short answer on it which is essentially um, it's it's critical, right? So 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 it's a pretty complicated uh, chain, kinetic chain, right there. And typically, so your your the socket of the ball and socket joint of your shoulder is connected to your shoulder blade. So the better position your posture is, shoulders back, shoulder blades in a good position, that tends to unload a lot of the stress. It keeps the it keeps the socket in the correct place, um, and you also have the synchronization of movements between the the the, the shoulder blade, the scapula, and the the, the, the ball of the ball and socket joint. So it takes a lot of stress off of the soft tissues of the shoulder and thus reduces your risk towards injury. Anyone want to take a shot? I guess I'll just add the how, right? So Steve, Dr. Fred laid, laid out a lot of good points as to how posture can, can pr improve the kinematics of the shoulder joint. One of the things, um, and I know you lift weights yourself, is important with the lifting is making sure you're doing your pulling exercises, right? Heavy bent rows, pull-ups rowing, anything where you're doing a pulling motion, either a horizontal pull or a vertical pull, I think is going to strengthen the posterior chain and help keep yourself in a better position. So a good rule of thumb for the gym or for anyone listening, and if you have kids that are starting to lift, when you're doing your push and pull exercise, you're doing your bench press, that's your push exercise, make sure you're pairing that up with at least three pulling exercises to go with it. And that's going to, you know, a, a quick, tweak, uh, quick tweak you can make at the gym where you can start to um, improve your shoulder health and improve that posture. Well, that'll bring to a conclusion another week here. Shoulder injury is an important one. Uh, I've dealt with them a lot. I see a lot of kids also, and I know some of it too involves a lot of pain management. So if your kids do get hurt, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the world or the end of the, of the season by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, Dr. Stephen Fry here at Recon, thank you for your time. Great stuff. And uh, Dan Goring, PT right here as well. Awesome stuff, guys. Jimmy, uh, great seeing you guys. Uh, Thanksgiving's next week, I think, so we are off, uh, I believe. I don't think we'll be doing Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, but we'll be back in, in the future. I'd like to thank our sponsors tonight, Total Turf Experience here in Pittman, the Energy Lab, and Recon Sports. For Jim McCrossin, I'm Chris Terrian. We'll see you guys after Thanksgiving. Have a Happy great Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.